We're going to uh, continue with the AFib session. Uh, we've got uh, two more talks. Uh, uh, Dr. Ad will speak on, uh, on the Cox Maze 4, which is an extension and evolution of what he just spoke on, and then Dr. Hoff will, uh, uh, will, uh, will talk about uh, what he's going to uh, say. Niv? Yeah, so I, uh, I'll breeze through this. Uh, can we have the slide back? Okay. So I'll breeze through this um, rather quickly. So as we said, the first part was the technology. The second part was a, a paper came in 98 that led us to believe that most of the problem, if not all of it, it's in the pulmonary veins. Now, there are papers from the same time by known electrophysiologists that didn't show the same thing. And the concept of us thinking that this is all from the pulmonary vein is the wrong concept. And I'll walk through, I don't want to be uh, uh, too labor about it, but, but uh, this is what you see in mechanism of AFib based on the AHRS guidelines. And the, f the first time I saw it, I said, well, this is, this is a joke. I mean, nobody understand it, nobody can explain it. I mean, it's, it's all based on partial fact, multiple fact, and so on and so forth. And most importantly, some of those mechanisms are based on patients that were mapped after ablation. That ablation can cause arrhythmia and ablation can cause a different mechanism of arrhythmia. So basically there, are, there is a lot of uh, uh, to be said, and, 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 and again, watch you, uh, Ralph and his lab, but also Yoram Rudy, who is another uh, important uh, individual in, in developing mapping systems, and the new, new and up-and-coming one is the Cardio Insight, actually show that basically if you look, go to uh, Chronic atrial fibrillation, which is the old the, the definition, basically you can tell that this is right and left atrium, and sometimes none of them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, as a word of caution, I think that what we need to pay attention to more than 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 the type of AFib is basically the duration of AF. Duration of AF, in my mind, is basically more more important than any of the types. And this is your Moody's work showing that basically if you have a complexity index, meaning that, you know, how you map it and so on and so forth, it, it is more complex, it is less easy to explain when you come to patients that are more complex. And this is why we all shift our attention in surgery, at least not to the non paroxysmal which I think it may be a mistake. And I can actually start to prove it now and, and we will come with some publication because now we are mapping all patients with mitral disease with cardio insight and it's, it's kind of interesting what we find. We also, uh, ourselves, we, this is the first of our works, but we have some, some others coming, show that basically it doesn't matter where you biopsy the atrium. If you look at mitochondrial function or dysfunction, it's basically a systemic, both left and right atrium. So theoretically, any part of the atrium can fibrillate at any point. And we find those uh, uh, mechanisms that are com completely aberrant in patients with atrial fibrillation. So I, I don't know if this is the right way to describe it. I think it's a moving target. And, and basically, uh, this, is, so this is why the, the maze is working. So what characterizes AFib? Um, it's, you know, atrial remodeling is very important, associated with AF duration probably, probably not a stable model, meaning that if you map the same patient 365 days a, week, a year, you're not going to find the same mechanism every time. It's going to look different. And um, basically, at a certain threshold, AF results in a systemic biatrial disease. Substrate is very, very modified, and, and we have to be very, very careful. And we have no ability to predict in a given patient what's the mechanism of tomorrow. We might be able to predict what's the mechanism of today. So ablating the mechanism of tomorrow or today is not necessarily the mechanism of tomorrow. So I use this example. The, Choluteca Teca Bridge in Honduras, I, I, I'm sure I missed, uh, mispronounced it. That's a very interesting story. And I think after you see the picture, it will go with you. And every time you ablate a patient, you're going to remember it. Because what happened there is every hurricane season, the river was uh, flooded, the bridges were destroyed, 
and the two parts of the city uh, from two sides of the, the river were not, were not co connected. So the Japanese uh, Hazamad and the corporation decided to build the bridge that's going to sustain hurricane force of 10 or whatever. Nothing is going to break it. And Mitch came, Hurricane Mitch came in the late 90s, dropped uh, uh, a lot of rain over the place and you know, days of devastation, not just there, but uh, across uh, certain parts of Middle and North America. And after it was all uh, said and done, this was left. So the bridge sustained the hurricane, but the problem moved. And I think, I think it's funny, but I think when I saw this picture, I said, aha, uh -huh, now I get it. This is why the maze is working, because the maze is multiple bridge trying to predict the future of the problem. So it's a very primitive concept. It's not based on any sophisticated ablation or uh, mapping. It's not based on any of this. It's based on probability and uh, how to eliminate the existence of atrial fibrillation and not how it starts. And this is why it's so successful. So we have to be very, very uh, 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 careful before we move it on. And even the most perfect catheter ablation try to imitate the maze procedure. So if you try to imitate, imitate a, 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 an anatomical approach, why would you map? Save yourself money, save yourself time, and just go for an anatomical approach. So there is more to the story, but I think that the strength of the maze procedure is basically that, <coughs> that you know, we can't map the, the patients and, and, and predict what's going to start it tomorrow. Um, um, and even, even uh, uh, the most extensive uh, hybrid uh, integrated approach are based on anatomical approach, which is mimicking the maze procedure. And the big advantage of hybrid procedure, I think today, today is that we learn from the failures and we can improve what we are doing. And as I alluded to earlier, we are working on the next generation devices. So why the maze works? Because it is an anatomical approach. And I, I never uh, eliminated this lesion, but everything but this lesion is what we call the maze three or four and so on and so forth. But everything is maze three. This is not, the maze four is just you know, uh, because you isolate the pulmonary veins bilaterally, okay, and and um, uh, but uh, but the 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 concept, the electrophysiological concept, is the same as the maze three. Nothing is new here, except for a couple of lesions going to the appendages instead of cutting them, which was part of our work in the in, in at Georgetown. And I can tell you a quick story. You know that Dr. Cox was almost sued by a patient because one of the nurses of Dr. Cox told the patient that he had a maze four, but he came for maze three. And this is a true story because the maze, you know, with a conception that this is not a cut and sew maze, uh, uh, she called it a maze four, but it's actually a maze three lesion set. So it's kind of interesting. So when we publish today, we, we call it maze three four because electrophysiologically it's the same concept. And he never called it Cox maze, by the way. He always called it a maze procedure. So we said all that. We know biatrial is more uh, efficient than efficacy than the uniatrial, and, and we need to uh, move forward and work on it. So left sided worked very, very well. And I'll breeze through it. This is a paper we published uh, last January in the annals. We look into only in our uh, left-sided maze procedure paper in Innova. Um, we didn't have so many, but we have quite a few, 150, I think. And as you can see, success rate of antiretinic drugs for all comers is 79% <coughs> at, at two years, which is not, not so bad. And we didn't find any difference between PVI only and a more complete lesion set. But um, Look at this, I think this is important. If you look at predictors for failures, at zero or over two, when I consider it for now, age, size of left atrium, type of atrial fibrillation, and duration of atrial fibrillation, if you have zero predictors, you have very good success rate, 91% in two years of medication. I mean, it's a small group of patients, but it's consistent for PVI and left-sided only. However, if you have two predictors, it drops to 70, 71% in two years. 
and, and there is more to the story because, um, because there is a selection bias here. Uh, as in our place, the patient that went for left-sided only needed to be a little bit uh, 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 on the low side of a risk of recurrence. And more importantly, age. The older patients had left arterial only, and age is the strongest predictor. If you go and read the paper in, in, in completeness, you'll see the age is the most consistent uh, predictor of failure when it comes to left-sided only. And mind you, the older patients, we want to take them off anticoagulation, and therefore, this is probably not, not always the right thing to do. Also, we compare, com compared in a, in a well-quoted paper now uh, different uh, approaches as a, as, uh, for safety and efficacy. A lot of epicardial paper, hybrid procedure, only two full cryo maze procedure, minimally invasively. And as you can see here, at uh, one year, there's already significant difference in success rate between the on-pump, standalone cryo maze procedure versus the different others and it comes in a price of probably higher complication rates in the off-pump procedures compared to the minimally invasive cryo maze procedures. That brought us to uh, the new AATS guidelines. You know, the European published their guidelines. STS and AATS actually were coordinated in the effort, uh, and the AATS is the last of the three to come out, uh, used a different methodology uh, for uh, a statistically assessment of the, of the data, and we came with some uh, um, um, uh, recommendation. Basically, hybrid procedure is a class 2B with the uh, evidence of non-randomized studies. Hopefully, there are a couple now that, uh, that are randomized uh, controlled studies that uh, um, may add to our uh, um, uh, information. Epicardial ablation, minimally invasive non-hybrid is a class 2A. Uh, because there are some uh, randomized studies in the, st in, in the, in, in, in the literature. The, the, the FAST is the most uh, uh, famous one, but there are other <coughs> a couple of more and so on and so forth. But, but as important, we basically show that, that um, we had a recommendation for ablation technology and uh, with cryoablation on pump and bipolar on and off pump, and basically, we do not recommend the use of unipolar unidirectional radio frequency ablation outside of clinical trial as the efficacy are questionable. This is in the guidelines now, and it has very high evidence rate uh, based on the, the work from, from, from uh, Ralph's uh, lab. The other point now, uh, before I show you quickly the results from our minimal invasive standalone maze procedure, is the, the myth that Biatrial lesion set is associated with high rate of pacemakers if performed appropriately. There is a paper coming in Journal of Thoracic next month from our center, um, close to 800 full maze procedures uh, with 7% um, um, pacemaker rate and only 2% pacemaker rate in standalone atrial fibrillation. For the concomitant one, the predictor for a pacemaker was multiple valve uh, procedures, which are nothing with the maze procedure. And the problem, and especially the problem in the New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, from, from Gilinov, is the way you handle the right atrium. And I can tell you, I wasn't yelled a lot in my career as a resident, uh, except for by my wife. But uh, uh, the only one time that Jim Cox actually yelled at me was when I grabbed the lateral part of the atrium when I was assisting him on a maze procedure. He say, don't ever dare to grab this part with your pickups. What do I see every time I proctor a maze procedure? I see that basically this is the most abused part of the atrium by any surgeon. Why it's important? It's important because we don't really know where the sinus node is. I know, you know, and we all went through anatomy classes and so on and so forth, and we also don't know where the sinus node area, tachycardia area is. It's somewhere along the, the lateral wall and the crystal terminalis, and you can learn more about it. But more important, more importantly, in patients with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, often the sinus node is damaged. It's fibrosed. And therefore, all the rhythm, or what we call sinus rhythm, will, will be generated from this area. So if you violate the corridor, you make it too narrow, or you abuse it with pickups and so on and so forth, you are going to end up with issues. 
And the issues are that it's not going to conduct well. This is why I modified the maze procedure on the right side, and basically I am no longer doing the, the, that lesion going laterally uh, uh, from the right atrial appendage, and I still do the lesion going to the 10 o'clock of the tricuspid valve, that's medially, and, and, and basically uh, the same way here. And mind you, even if I do an atriotomy, I do it very far away, I don't do it here, I do it down here. Now I know that there is a new lesion that Etricure is pushing that goes from here to here to skip this one. I think this is a dangerous lesion. It will create many, many more pacemakers because often surgeons will do this because you don't see well. If you want to avoid this bursting here and you have an atriotomy, take the cryopop, bend it, slide it to the inside, lay it against, with the, with, with the belly of it, lay it against the tricuspid valve and ablate all the way up. You don't have to be inside out if you're doing a robot or you're doing whatever. This will cause many, many more pacemakers. The other point is when you do the SVC lesion, imagine that you sit in the right, in the left, in the right atrium, the lesion should go down to the seven o'clock. It shouldn't be laterally or, or upwards. By doing all this, you are going to have much less pacemakers. Now, the right, the left side is, is basically nothing have changed. You circle the pulmonary veins, with a cryo, and basically a lesion to the, a lesion to the uh, base of the left atrial appendage. This is the most important lesion maybe uh, uh, that we all, most of us miss, is basically the, epica the endocardial cryo lesion going to the mitral valve, depends where the coronary is, and you see that, uh, that blue dot, they have to basically overlap, and this is an epicardial lesion to going to the uh, coronary sinus. And the way to do it minimally invasively as the oblique sinus is open is basically put your retractor here and pull up so you can actually see the coronary sinus and just focus on that. You don't have to ablate the entire back wall again because you are running a risk that the tip of your ablator, if you are epicardially, is going to lay on the ventricle and then you are going to have some arrhythmias, uh, more significant, some more significant than others when you go uh, into the post-op care. If you do that, you can have a very, very good reliable results. So we did over, over 300 standalone mazes in the past uh, uh, 11 years, uh, you know, until the point I left Inova, but only 133 of them were qualified to be uh, uh, minimally invasive for, long, for long-standing persistent or persistent atrial fibrillation. So we took the paroxysmal out, we took the mid-sternotomy out, and this is what we left with. And we have some 60-some patients with five years follow-up, which is, believe it or not, the largest series in the, in the literature when this will get to be published. What do we learn from here? Well, not too much. Those are fairly healthy patients, I would say. Duration of AFib is, is quite long, and left atrium is 4.9. If we combine duration of AFib over five years and left atrium over 5.5 centimeters, we have 15% uh, of this uh, population. So those are the extreme. Uh, and as you can see, 78% long-standing persistent, and um, uh, median ablation uh, numbers is one to two, uh, is two, but very interestingly, only 50% of them or so had previous catheter ablation. And this is what I always say, when you work with your cardiologist, with the EPs, and they know what you do, and they know what you deliver, and you communicate, they would not even send their patient to a catheter ablation before they send the patient to you. So when I hear surgeons say, hey, nobody's going to send me patients, I say, of course, because you're not serious about it. So, so I, think, I think after you see the results, you understand why we need to keep in the algorithm, why would we, we need to keep uh, a, a, a minimal invasive maze procedure? Look at the results. Prolonged ventilation over, over 24 hours, five patients, pneumonia, one patient, no strokes. One TIA in a patient that had five ablation before that made us change our, our philosophy, and with these patients, we start IV heparin two hours after surgery when we see that there is no uh, issue. Uh, two reoperations for bleeding. One of them, you know, I know it's an excuse, but it's a patient who couldn't get uh, portamine, so we took him the next day to evacuate a, a chest wall hematoma. Only 3% with transfusion of blood and 6% of any transfusion, no renal failure, 
Median stay of four days, usually for anticoagulation, readmission for arrhythmia within 30 days of 11% and no death at 30 days. Okay, so I think this shows safety. And what about efficacy? Well, single intervention, and this is very important. The guidelines would say that there are two definitions, one being in sinus rhythm and being in sinus rhythm after intervention. So if you have a patient, let's say you have 100 patients, they had a procedure, they had a hybrid, let's say two-stage hybrid, and then a year out, the patient has an AFI, had an ablation, and was monitored three months later as in sinus rhythm. That's a failure, because you have a procedure that's beyond the index procedure. This is a single procedure success. At five years, 79% of medication, 90% if you allow medication. Okay, now, what are the other issues? These are whole halter monitorings 24 hours. So people will say, aha, you don't do event monitors. Well, the, the reveal, even if you put it here, we wouldn't have it here. So nobody has data on reveal for five years. But more importantly, two years and six months, all the patients that were asymptomatic off medication were offered to have a, a one week halter monitoring. And guess what? 98% of the patients that were in sinus rhythm by halter were in sinus rhythm by one week halter monitoring. The only failure was a patient with continuous atrial fibrillation, long-standing persistence, at one event of 47 seconds. But 30 seconds is a failure. Now, the reveal is not, more, is not capturing less than two minutes. That's another problem. So those are excellent results, and we are very, very proud. And I can tell you more. Look at the, at the way the burden looks. These are the types of AFib that we monitor for the patient. The fact that it's, it's in, the patient is in AFib doesn't necessarily mean that they are in continuous AFib. In a matter of fact, the continuous, the, the, there are no continuous uh, AFib uh, uh, when you go so far out. Uh, if, maybe you can say the unknown one because it was not uh, marked well is, is a continuous one. But most of them have a much lower burden than they had before. And stroke, freedom from stroke is, uh, is uh, quite, a, quite uh, impressive. And more importantly, 80% of our, 84 percent of our patients are off anticoagulation 24 months. This, this figure is being maintained. It's about 82 at five years. But 98 percent of the patients that are eligible to be off anticoagulation are off anticoagulation. This patient needs to get anticoagulation anyhow. They have other indications. Either they are hypercoagulable, you know, that thromboembolic events, and so on and so forth. Only two patients at, 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 uh, at two, one year, and only 1% of the patient at, two, at five years are, are, are on anticoagulation. And this is a big, big, big discussion now, but I want to refer to another patient, a paper of ours, actually two of them that came one after the other, that showed that basically, uh, if we look at patients uh, over time, this is a kaplan meier curve, this is freedom from stroke, and this is freedom from bleeding. Okay, but more importantly, this is freedom from anticoagulation and this is freedom from stroke. You see there is no correlation when you stop the anticoagulation in patients after a maze procedure as opposed to uh, where the stroke happened. And this brought to a second uh, paper after this that one is the CHAT score is, is completely irrelevant when it comes to a full maze procedure and exclusion of the left arterial appendage. And the second one, a new, a new paradigm about you know, how to treat patients with anticoagulation. Quality of life improved, and, 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 and this is uh, really significant. Now, what do we do here for the uh, left arterial appendage? So we started by closing the appendage from the inside. At six months, I was unhappy because at 4.8% of the patients, we had some recommunication, although in the, in the operating room it was fine. So we started to introduce, and we published it in innovation, uh, the epicardial a transverse sinus approach for the left arterial appendage, and we have done it in, I don't even know how many patients, and it looks extremely, extremely well. So the PRO, the PRO2 is actually amazing for it because it has this, there is no cage, and, and we are doing well there. Quality of life improved, and, and basically, um, I think that when we look at it now, we say, okay, this is what we have to aim to, and, and this is why we work so hard on those beating heart procedures to improve them, to make them equivalent to the results we have here. And we can, but we don't have the right technology yet. And I think we need to, to work on it. So Steve, I took too much time today. Let's have you. <laughs>